In this short talk episode, I speak to Kavita Ganesan about the AI mindset for your business. We discuss the risks of integrating AI into businesses, including the misconception that AI is 100% accurate and the potential of misinformation to be propagated by non-experts. One of the things that we discuss is the impact of AI on different types of jobs, including the potential displacement of knowledge workers. This is a conversation on the risks and opportunities of integrating AI into your business and how to measure its success. I create clear thinking and decisive leaders who can amplify their influence. Contact me to find out how I can help you or your organisation. And today our guest is Kavita Ganesan. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. You are welcome. Um, Kavita, now let me think. What types of things make you want to get up and dance? Is there any type of music or anything? Um, so ev- every day I just look forward to um, all the new angles of problems to work on in my job, which mm-hmm. is uh, related to AI. Um, so even though the the types of problems may be the same um, AI problems, but the way you solve it for each client is a bit different. So there's a lot of problem solving involved. So that gets me really excited because I think inherently I'm a problem solver. Mm. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. And you said that you uh, work with AI. So tell us a little bit more about you. Yeah, so... I started off with AI um, back in 2005 when I was pursuing a graduate degree Mm -hmm. in computer science. Um, And that progressed into me being full-time in AI and getting a PhD along the way in the field. Mm -hmm. And uh, around 2011, 2013, big data and data science started becoming a real um, popular thing. And that's the time I graduated with my PhD. So I jumped in and solved a lot of industry AI problems. And as that was happening, I was getting more and more consulting requests. So which is how I slowly transitioned from a full-time employee to a consultant, which is what I do now. Um, I do AI consulting, I train teams, um, I help with the implementation of AI so I do a, a variety of things uh, in my work now. Okay, that sounds good. So you help your clients with AI. Is this about integrating AI into their business? Yeah, so I have different types of clients. Like startups are always need this help with like AI design. So they have a, they're mainly AI startups. Mm-hmm. So they need to figure out how to even... Um, implement the algorithm or the solution. So how to get started. So I help them with end-to-end design and advise them along the way, like what the algorithm looks like, uh, what kind of data is needed to develop the algorithm, how do you evaluate it, uh, how do you integrate it into the application. So a lot of technical work and design work with the AI startups. Mm -hmm. And then Mid-sized to enterprise clients, they often need um, like training on how to think about AI. How do they find opportunities in their workflows? Um, so a lot of high-level thinking. And that's where my workshops come in. It trains um, like managers on who have no experience with AI to think, to have an AI mindset, to understand what are the opportunities, what are the risks, how do they find these opportunities in their workflows? so that they can actually take those opportunities and then get them implemented or buy solutions to solve those problems. And also how to evaluate it once it's integrated. So yeah, so it's a mix of things that I do. Thanks. So what are the risks of integrating AI into your business? Yeah, so oftentimes there's a misconception that AI is like magic. It's going mm. to be... accurate. But as you've seen in the case of even chat GPT, a lot of the answers are non-factual. So that's a big problem of AI systems where it can also make mistakes. Just like humans, AI systems make mistakes. And when they are developing AI systems, uh, 
we have like an evaluation uh, number, like it's 95% accurate, 85% accurate. So these numbers, people don't really pay attention to. And that's a risk because then they don't understand that it can make mistakes. And we've also seen this in self-driving cars where the AI within the self-driving car failed to see an object on the road and therefore it got into an accident. So, and then people are um, surprised that, hey, how can this car, this really smart car make that mistake? Well, that's because there's an AI system and AI system can make mistakes. Um, so that's one risk of AI, um, that it's not 100% accurate and we need to set our expectations right. Um, the just second jumping, risk, I'll just go ahead. There. I think what's interesting is that um, you see a lot of people talking about how AI can do X, Y, Z for them, but you need to have a certain level of expertise to know the information is wrong. So, you know, you, if you if you don't, because a lot of things I've seen is people say, oh, you can use AI to, to sell anything, you know, even if you have no expertise in this area, you know, and it seems to be one of the things that's been sold to consultants particularly is you can make more money by writing a book on X or developing coaching on Y, even if like, even if you're not an expert because chat GPT and, and the other AI systems will be able to help you. But if you don't have the base knowledge, if you're not an expert already, how do you know well, what you're getting is actually right or not? Yes, and that is, I think, uh, one of the downstream problems that we're going to see with ChatGPT. There are going to be uh, many wannabe experts who are not really experts and are, in fact, propagating misinformation or wrong, uh, wrong information um, to the public. Um, yeah, so I think where AI shines is having humans in the loop. So human experts. So AI system can make our workflows uh, more streamlined, like it can do a lot of the groundwork for you, like maybe get you the information, but you have to still be the layer, quality assurance layer. Mm -hmm. So even if you use AI to write a blog post, you need to verify the factual accuracy because AI systems can make, make up facts as you've seen with ChatGPT. Um, and Selling that ChatGPT can help you make a lot of money is a very risky proposition, I would say, because you still need that human expertise um, along with the AI system. Yeah. Okay. So if somebody's sitting there and they're thinking, should I do AI or should I not have AI? What's the business case for AI? Yeah, so it, it's very application dependent and also the domain dependent. So for example, in healthcare, um, you can have an AI system make predictions, um, like maybe you have a risk of um, lung cancer. So let's say a patient, it makes prediction that a patient has a risk of lung cancer. So in this case, the person, the hospital has an option of whether to use the AI system as a sole decision maker or to um, have the physician in the loop um, to help them make this uh, decision. Like to, it becomes more of a recommendation. And then the physician still has to use the expertise to determine if this is a valid um, prediction that the AI system has made. Um, so by using AI in the loop, it just simplifies their workflow. Like it, it crunches all that data and says, this is my recommendation. And mm -hmm. then it provides evidence of where, uh, of why it made the recommendation. So it makes their workflow a lot more um, streamlined. But there is also an ethical part to this where do you just want to trust the AI system or do you also want to have a physician in the loop? So it's very um, application dependent. And if you use it in an ethical way, it can really be helpful rather than be a, a risk or a hindrance. So I would say common sense use of AI in specific areas is where it will really help. So another example is in manufacturing. So there's a lot of repetitive manual work, like say in quality assurance, 
by using AI in the mix, it's going to uh, make the work of the test engineers a lot easier because it's going to say, so these are the defects, look at these. Instead of the engineers going and looking for those defects themselves, which they could miss just because the defects are so small that their human eye just doesn't see it. Um, so you can imagine the amount of uh, productivity improvement it can create right there by just pointing out these um, defects to them. And they, their job is to verify these defects. So, so in such use cases where there's a lot of manual repetitive work, it's highly inefficient, the use of AI is really going to um, enhance workflows. What about, um, thank you for that. What about knowledge workers, you know, white collar <clears throat> workers, that kind of stuff where um, it, there's some cognitive ability required, some specialism required. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're more prone, aren't they, to, for AI to wipe, to wipe out? Um, to wipe out knowledge workers? Well, I'm just thinking is that um, so in all the other major sweeping change, the, the mm -hmm. people mostly affected were low skilled workers, weren't they? Like you said, like in manufacturing, you know, if you think about, you know, the Model T and all this kind of like manual work and low mm -hmm. skilled work gets gets done. Um, whereas now, if if you're if you're, I don't know, uh, a potentially a bookkeeper, um, someone who does research for mm -hmm. um, a law practice, um, mm -hmm. those kinds of stuff, which is not necessarily, it is routine, but it's not necessarily low in the cognitive work, but it's the type of thing that a specialised AE, maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but certainly the year after, we'll be able to come in and say, right, okay, we don't need as many people to do this because the AI can crunch all that data um, and yes. produce it. And that, so the risk, whilst, you, whilst it will take out low-skilled low a little bit, the bigger risk is that kind of big swerve in the middle, isn't it, where you've got, if you're a... If you're a generalist, mm -hmm. you're probably mm -hmm. a bit more secure than if you're a specialist. Because mm -hmm. even now we've yes. seen like in America, isn't there a, an AI law firm that helps people get out of parking tickets or something? Yes, yes. You know, yeah. that, that already exists, isn't it, where they go through all the court, they know all the cases and stuff, and they can produce a reasonable response. Yes, in those cases, in you probably need less people to man those jobs. But what would happen is that these others who got displaced will have to uh, will take on different roles because AI systems will then create those different roles. Like in order to even train these AI systems, you need good data. And those people may become, instead of people watching over these tools, they become data generators for these uh, AI systems or the managers of this AI system, so to ensure that it's performing correctly. So yeah, so the job, the nature of jobs in those types of roles will slowly transition, just as we have seen in manufacturing from doing really low level stuff, you're, you're going to be doing more high level stuff, which I think is a good thing because it's going to push people into more jobs where they have to use their brains, their thinking, um, their collaboration. So yeah, I think there'll be a short-term pain in those areas, but then through reskilling, um, people will find jobs in um, areas where they can contribute. Yeah, I think the, yeah. the the time the time required to to reskill mm -hmm. while some of the people may not be long enough. Because like, I mean, I'm just thinking like yeah. I think like in the UK it, it, when I think about um, people that worked, uh, say either you know mining coal for example, they weren't able mm -hmm. to suddenly in large numbers become office yeah. workers, and I think those 
those that learn how to, you're right, those that learn how to use AI in their roles to become more mm-hmm. productive um, and be, you know, help them to in their creativity are more likely to survive than those who don't learn. And I think, I think whilst business owners, freelancers are actively working with AI to figure out what to do with it, I'd imagine right. there's millions of office workers who aren't. Yes, correct. And I think it's just like any other job. If you don't keep up with what's changing, you are likely to lose what you have and unable to find a new job as, a, as opposed to if you're keeping up with AI and you're tracking the trends. Um, yeah, so it's just, I, I would say it's just like any other job. You have to keep up to be able yeah. to, yeah, to be able um, to be employed. Uh-huh. Okay, so how does a business measure the success of their AI integration? Yeah, so typically what they look for uh, is a financial return on investment, but that's not how AI systems work. AI systems, they solve very specific problems. So the way I teach my clients to measure AI success is to look at three uh, components. The first is, um, is the solution, the AI solution, we call it the model. So is it working as expected? What, did it, what is its accuracy? So that's that I call model success. So if the system is not doing well, um, it has really low accuracy, and then you start using it, it's highly likely you're going to see problems downstream. So that's why this model success is very critical. Um, then once the model is has reasonable accuracy and then you deploy it into your workflow. So let's say uh, it's in customer service and the job of the AI system is to route tickets to the correct support uh, agents. Um, the next step is to measure business success, which is um, the metrics that are of interest uh, to the business that you're trying to use AI to improve. And this can be maybe customer satisfaction scores or it can be different KPIs very related to the AI problem. Um, so that's that's another part. So the business success and the business metrics of interest. <clears throat> and then the third, third part that I always recommend uh, companies to use is user success. So you can have a really great AI solution, but if the end user, like maybe the customer service agent, um, does not like the way this thing works, it's like it puts friction in their workflow, they have to take 10 additional steps to consume the AI system's output, uh, they're unlikely to use it for the long term. They may just help you with testing, but they're not going to use it. They may go back to their old way of doing things. So measuring user success is also critical when it comes to AI and is to get feedback of the user. Like, do you see this as a solution that's going to solve your problem? Um, do you see any problems with the output? Um, and also just getting their feedback. Like, are you, are you going to be using this solution? Do you see that this solution is something you could use in the long term? So getting their feedback will bring up all sorts of issues with maybe the model or the way it's being deployed. Um, so it'll raise a lot of uh, usability issues. So these are the three areas I would say you need to focus on to measure AI success. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Uh, before we go, is there anything you want to leave the audience with? Um, Sure, yeah. So when you're thinking about AI, um, often you may not even need AI. There are software tools that already do what what needs to be done. And if if you're trying to use AI in the loop, just keep in mind there is a risk. And the risk can be, it can be biased, it can be incorrect information, it can be mistakes. So you want to think about the risk before you think about using AI in your workflow and um, and don't take AI's recommendation at face value in um, 
in very risky applications like healthcare applications always have like a checkpoint, uh, like a quality assurance layer. So I would say use AI with um, with a grain of salt, I would say. Hmm. I yeah. would not expect you to say that. So that is fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Kavita, for coming on the show. And thank you for having me. You're welcome. And thank you for tuning in to the Maverick Paradox podcast. I am Jeff Germain, your host, and I hope you have enjoyed listening to today's conversation with Kavita as much as I enjoyed having it. The Maverick Paradox. Judith Germain is an author, speaker, consultant, mentor and trainer, and the leading authority on Maverick leadership. She is the founder of The Maverick Paradox, which supports organizations to enhance their leadership capabilities and to help business owners develop and grow their businesses. Judith enables individuals, business owners and organizations to improve their impact and influence. She is also HR Zone's leadership columnist, and her expert opinion has appeared in national, international, and trade press.